All right. Welcome, everybody. I wanted to continue with the simplex algorithm today. So without giving away the punchline, let's just try to maximize this uh, problem with this linear program. We're trying to maximize x1 subject to these constraints. And notice we also have a non-negativity constraint on, on both our variables, x1 and x2. And let's just see how we do. OK. So if you'll remember, the first step is to put our program in equational form. I want to change all these inequalities into equalities. And I do that by introducing slack variables, as we've already done here. So x3 is the slack in terms of how far this inequality is from being an equality. And then x4 is the slack in this equation. And then x3 and x4 should also both be non-negative. So now all my variables are equipped still with non-negativity constraints. When you have a slack variable for every equation, equation, it's easy to find a starting basic feasible solution, right? X3 and X4, those columns, you know, in this, in this matrix, if I looked at this matrix of coefficients, what it would look like, let me write it out, is 1, negative 1, 1, 0, and negative 1, 1, 0, 1. These are the coefficients coming from here. And the slack variables that I've added, you know, their columns form an identity matrix. So certainly you can use these slack variables to get a basic feasible solution. So I'm choosing um, x3 and x4 to be my basic variables. And so that's why I write them down on the left-hand side in my simplex tableau. This first line is obtained by solving for x3. And the second line is obtained by solving for x4. Um, and then z is our notation for the function we're trying to optimize, which is just x1. OK. Hopefully you're all with me, but speak up if not. Now we want to try to improve our optimization function. So we want to try to increase x1. So we look at our two equations. Can I increase x1 in these equations? In the equation for x4, yeah, I can increase x1 as much as I want, and x4 will, will still remain non-negative. In the first equation, I can only increase x1 up to 1. Because otherwise, if x1 got larger, x3 would be negative, contradicting my non-negativity constraints. So I'm going to pivot on x1. And um, my limiting equation is the first one, the equation for x3. So I rewrite that for x1. And then in the equation for x4, I replace x1 with that line I just wrote down, 1 plus x2 minus x3. So this becomes 3. The x2s cancel. And then I have um, minus x3. All right. And the function that we're now trying to optimize is x1, which is 1 plus x2 minus x3. OK, so now what variable do I want to pivot on to increase this function? I want to pivot on x2, because by making x2 larger, I can make my optimization function larger. From the perspective of this equation, I can increase x2 as much as I want. Also, from the perspective of this equation, I can increase x2 by as much as I want, right? So x2, I can increase by as much as I want. So how do I pivot on x2? I haven't really taught you all this, but any, any guesses of what's going on geometrically or you know, what's the answer to our optimization problem? Is our feasible region polytope unbounded so that we can just sort of keep growing infinitely exactly unbounded 
ness is the exception we're looking at. When, when the simplex method or when linear programs are presented, often you assume things, like you assume it's bounded, you assume that there exists a solution. But the simplex method is pretty robust. You can just start running it and it'll find out for you if your feasible region is unbounded or it'll, find, it'll discover for you if there's no feasible solution. So notice that when we try to pivot on this variable x2, we can make x2 as large as we want and we can make the optimization function as large as we want. So we, we found not only like a, a single feasible solution, we found a feasible ray going off to infinity. What is this ray? So it's a set of all points, x1, x2, x3, x4, where x2 I'll just call x2. All right. Um, you know, x3 is a, in this tableau, x3 is a non-basic variable, so it better be zero. And then I have equations for x1 and x4 in terms of x2 and x3. So x1 becomes 1 plus x2. And x4 becomes 3 minus 0. Right. So this is an entire array. It's varying over all x2 bigger than or equal to 0. And the, the simplex method has found this array for us. Geometrically, OK, I've, I've, I've copied down again the original problem. But geometrically, this is what's going on. Here's our feasible region in x1, x2 space before I added the slack variables, x3 and x4. We began the simplex method at this basic feasible solution. We pivoted once along x1. And then we pivoted on x2 and saw that you could increase x2 up to infinity. Making, um, making the optimization function as large as you want. Um, yeah, this, this objective function, 1 plus x2, is obtained just by plugging in x2 and 0 in there. All right, so this is one exception that can come up in the simplex method, but you shouldn't be scared of it. You just start handling the simplex method without paying any attention, and it finds out for you if you can make your maximization function arbitrarily large. Any public questions? Yeah, a quick one. Oh, yeah. Kyle, um, go ahead. How do we know on the picture that we went sort of along the bottom of the shape instead of the upper edge? Sure, I'm still getting better at this as well, but um, we did pivot on x1, right? So we started with um, you know we started with x1 and x2 as our non-basic um, solutions, and then we pivoted on x1, which meant we were increasing x1, so that's why it's easy to draw this arrow increasing in the x1 direction. Okay. Now here, once we got here, we pivoted on x2. That didn't mean that we moved in this direction. You know, it, it sort of meant that we moved in this direction along this infinite ray. Um, and so x2 is increasing along this infinite ray, but um, um, you know, we've sort of changed basis so that as you change x2, you also are changing x1 is how it's working. Yeah. So this is something that I haven't fully um, made my own yet, I would say, right? I can clearly see how pivoting on x1 moves us in this direction. And then pivoting on x2 moves us in that direction. You know, you can see that that increases x2, but it's not quite the same as just going directly that way. Yeah, if someone has more, uh, a, a better way of saying that, I'm um, all ears.
think there's more to be understood here than, than I've digested. Other questions? All right, thanks.